I'm Laura Flanders. Next up, a conversation about a new documentary, After Tiller, about the 35-year assault on the reproductive justice movement. Tiller was a target of anti-abortion extremists. His Wichita clinic was bombed in 1985, and then, at the age of 67, he was murdered at church. The death of Dr. Tiller leaves only four doctors in the country who are able to perform late-term abortions. It was absolutely no question in any of our minds that we were going to keep on doing this work. What really got me interested was when they started shooting doctors. I got five shots fired through the front windows of my office. Many, many times I felt so alone. How many times have you received threatening phone calls because of what I do? People call and I just hang up. When I walk out the door, I expect to be assassinated. Our goal is not merely to make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. Late-term abortions, this is where everybody draws the line. They said I was an abomination and should be driven from the state. I immediately started getting death threats in the middle of the night. You don't give in because it only gets worse. And that's the trailer for a new film, After Tiller. It looks at 35 years of attacks on abortion providers and just as many years of women having abortions anyway. It's about the men and women who continue this dangerous work and why they do what they do and the future that they hope for. With us is one of those doctors. She's Dr. Susan Robinson. Also with us, one of the film's two directors, Martha Shane. Martha, let's just start with you where your film starts. May 2009, I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. We saw the death, the killing of George Tiller in Wichita, Kansas. What's happened since in Wichita and nationally? Yeah, so after um, Dr. Tiller was murdered, his uh, clinic was closed. And so for us, the idea from the film really started watching that news coverage of the murder of Dr. Tiller and seeing how so often the media doesn't cover this issue correctly. You know, it's, it's always sort of a pro-choice talking point and an anti-abortion talking point and a controversial doctor was killed. And so we wondered sort of more about what Dr. Tiller's life was like. Um, did he have a family? What motivated him to keep doing this work after so many, year, so many years of harassment and threats? And so we started researching and we found out that there were only really four doctors who were openly doing this work in the U.S. And we're just shocked to discover that in a country of this size that the number would be so small. And, and then we started looking into who those people were and um, going out to meet them. Susan, um, tell us a little bit about your life, what your life is like, and do you remember the day when you heard what had happened to oh, I certainly do. It was, sure. Um, I, I was at home, and one of my colleagues, Shelley Zella, was at work, and she called and she said, Dr. Tiller has been killed. I, I was, uh, I remember that better than I remember when Kennedy was shot or mm -hmm. when I heard about 9-11. Because what did it mean to you? Oh, he was my friend, my teacher, my mentor. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. He was a very important person in my life and I admired him hugely. Tell us what you do and where are you in the country? Now I live in California and I work in Albuquerque, New Mexico and I tw switch weeks with my partner, Shelley Sella, my colleague, Shelley Sella. She lives in Oakland. And the two of us worked for Dr. Tiller, and after he was killed, we looked for another clinic that we could join that would be interested in offering the service of later abortion. So that's what I do right now, is I spend a week at home and then a week in Albuquerque working in the clinic, and then I go home and Shelley comes. You use the term later abortion, and that's for a reason that the film drives home very beautifully. Uh, talk about who your patients are, why they need this abortion that's often referred to in the 
money media as late-term abortion and is the kind that states around the country these days are trying to ban, outright ban? Well, who my patients are, um, probably 20 or a little over 20 percent of them are people who have highly desired pregnancies and they have a late diagnosis of a fetal anomaly, well over the limit of most states. Um, everything seems to be going fine and then one day something's a little funny so they do a higher level ultrasound and geez things don't look right meanwhile the pregnancy is progressing let's get you a fetal MRI two weeks later they get their MRI and oh I'm sorry to tell you that your baby is never going to recognize you will never walk will never speak mm -hmm. and there's nothing we can offer you and those people can come to Albuquerque and have a pregnancy termination. I would say another 30, 35% don't know they're pregnant. And that seems extraordinary. A lot of people say, well, how could they not know they're pregnant? But people continue to have what they consider are periods, or maybe their periods were always irregular. Maybe they're a little on the heavy side, so it doesn't show. But p people really honestly don't know they're pregnant, and this may not be their first pregnancy. And then there's a group of young, young women who are so terrified to tell their patients that they just deny it to themselves and sort of hope it'll go away. Don't tell their mom until their mom finally looks at their tummy and says, are you pregnant? No. Then they go and get a pregnancy test, and by that time they find out that they're way past the limit of any state, and they're 13, you know. And then there are a small number of other strangenesses, like their partner was abusive and held them captive, and they had to finally escape to get an abortion. There are a significant number of women who have been saving for an abortion, but they're so on the edge that they can't keep up with the rising price as the gestation advances. Is there one story in the film that, you, that stands out to you, Martha, of a, a woman? One of the stories that stood out the most was a patient um, who came to the clinic from Chicago and she just had been waiting. She's one of these women who I think we don't think about enough, but who are really living on the edge, as Dr. Robinson said. And she had been trying to save up money and when she got enough money, um, then her, her son got sick, so she couldn't leave. She had to stay. She had to pay for health care for her son. And, then it, and so it was just sort of one thing after another. And you can see how with, when someone is living really um, in poverty, doesn't have the sort of support net, network they have as a single mother, that it's just incredibly difficult to get to a clinic. And I think what, you know, spending time in the clinics really... Um, pointed out to me is just how inaccessible abortion is. It's easy to think living in New York City where I live that it's so easy to get an abortion earlier in pregnancy, but in so much of the country that's just not the case. Not easier earlier in pregnancy and almost impossible exactly. later in pregnancy. Did you say only four clinics left or only four providers left that are doing later term? Only four doctors who are open about doing this work, about doing the later abortions. Are you ever afraid? No. Really? Well, that's not quite true. <laughs> somebody, somebody called one time when I was at the clinic um, and left a, a number of messages with our answering service it, detailing how she planned to kill me. Um, and I was by myself in the clinic, and that I was somewhat nervous then. I wanted to know where those phone calls were coming from. Were they coming from Albuquerque or someplace else? But most of the time, I do not walk around feeling fearful, no. You're in a particular battleground state on this issue now. What? Suddenly has become Albuquerque. Some of the folks who, with the organization Operation Rescue, were the protesters outside of Dr. Tiller's clinic in Kansas, are now setting up a similar type of protest where you are. Yes, they moved to Wichita with the express purpose of putting Dr. Tiller out of business. After he was assassinated, and we moved to Albuquerque, which happened about six months later. They moved to Albuquerque with the express purpose of putting us out of business. So what is the relationship between the bills that we see being passed around the country, most recently Texas completely outlawing 
abortions after 20 weeks, no exceptions, notwithstanding that incredible 11-hour filibuster uh, on the floor. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship between the legislative assaults on a woman's uh, reproductive rights and the type of violence that you're talking about? Because some of those who were involved in the legislative effort says, well, we're the, the friendly alternative to having a war out there. Well, there's certainly, I mean, there's certainly a difference, but I think all of, for all of them, the goal is to make abortion either illegal or inaccessible, and there are different tactics for doing that. Um, and you know, like Dr. Hearn, who's in the film, he always points out that you know every person who's gone out and killed an abortion doctor has started out as a protester, protester quietly pre praying on the sidewalk outside of a clinic. Mm. So, um, you know, I think it's it was really interesting for us to learn how differently the the doctors handle um, those pro protesters and their different attitudes towards the protesters, but there's definitely some sort of connection there. It's a, it's a climate, you know, as Dr. Sell in the film says, in Wichita, there was sort of a climate of hatred towards Dr. Tiller and the work that he was doing. If I just give up and stop doing anything after 20 weeks, some women may get desperate and do things on their own. It's something that needs to be done. What drives women to seek a third trimester abortion? Unless people understand what's going on for the woman, it's impossible to support it. It's guilt no matter which way you go. Guilt if you go ahead and do what we're doing, or bring him into this world and then he doesn't have any quality of life. You have choices, they all suck. Sometimes it's been hard for me to feel that I could continue. Of course you don't want an abortion. Nobody wants an abortion. She had a disease where she can't bend at her joints. He could be a stillborn. Mm -hmm. She's just too far mm -hmm. along and I can't help her. What's the right thing to do? What's really helping people? I just thought the other day, I can't retire, my God. <laughs> there aren't enough of us. Takeaways from this film, Martha, for you, things that you discovered afresh. You say one aspect was you didn't really realize how rare abortion is, let alone later term abortion. Um, anything else? Yeah, I mean, I think that when people go in to see the film and also for us making the film, I think the takeaway is really just that this issue is so much more complicated than you ever could imagine and that it's really hard to, um, to imagine what decision you're going to make unless you're in this another person's shoes. And you, Dr. Robinson? I think people think that they do this casually, that they didn't think about it, that they just put it off because it wasn't convenient. No, these are women who find themselves in intolerable circumstances and are willing to do anything to be not pregnant. Um, this is not a decision that they undertake casually. They are not just putting it off because they don't know, you know, what to do. A very small percentage of them don't know right away that they want an abortion. The trouble is that they didn't know how far along they yeah. were. Why do you do this work? Did you grow up thinking, I want to be an abortion provider? No, I didn't even think I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I started doing it, well, I started thinking about it when the first shooting in Pensacola happened. And um, then when the Salvi shootings occurred in Brookline, Mass. We're talking the 90s now. Yeah, 95, I think it was. I said, I am going to go to Planned Parenthood and do abortions. It made me angry. You were a doctor. I was a doctor, and I was working in a place that actually did not offer abortion services and didn't want us to do abortions. And I was oblivious to the whole issue. But when that happened, I went. I said, I'm going to do that. And, it, and if you don't like it, you know, fire me. Why? I just felt that doctors were going to go running away. and. And when bullied, my response is to not run away, but to say, oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's, I started doing it, I started doing abortion care then. And I found it very gratifying because, you know, as a doctor, you're trying to reduce suffering in, in the world. And you can reduce the suffering of every patient who walks in your door in abortion care. And that is not true in any other field of medicine that I know of. Every woman walks in at a moment of crisis and you can solve her problem 
and you can treat her with kindness and dignity and compassion and make a huge difference to the way she feels about things. And for those women who are mourning, as you put it, a, a highly desirable, a highly desired yeah. pregnancy that went wrong somewhere? Those women, uh, you know, we do everything we can to make it clear that we see her baby as, a, as her baby. This is, if she's named it, we call it by name. Um, often those people want to view the baby, hold the baby, we'll take remembrance photographs for, the mm. for her. Anything to give her something to walk home with so she's not totally empty-handed. We work with a funeral home. Lots of people want to have their baby cremated. Isn't this all incredibly complicated, though, when you're at the same time saying women yes. have a right to terminate their pregnancy? Yes, but they, I mean, luckily those women do have a right to terminate it because they feel either that their baby would have a short, miserable life of suffering, and this is their one chance to do a good parenting act. This is their one chance to mother or father their baby is to not let it be born into a short, horrible life. And they feel it as a loss, as a death. It's completely different from the woman mm. who didn't know she was pregnant and didn't want to be pregnant and, oh my God, does certainly not want to be linked to whatever guy it was who got her pregnant. Which goes back to how complicated this is. There are more than two sides to this story. As a filmmaker, Martha, and I should say that you made this with Lana Wilson, your co-filmmaker, your co-film director, how did you deal with the pressure of feeling that you should be on one side or another, as it were, or working for a cause? Yeah, I mean, I think from the very beginning, we felt like sort of we had heard enough of the anti-abortion rhetoric. And so we didn't feel ever the need to go out and sort of interview the protesters. We felt very confident in our just focusing exclusively on these four doctors and really making it a more intimate portrait of their lives. Um, and then as we spent more time with them, we began to realize how sort of nuanced their own views are towards abortion, towards the work they, that they do. You know, you see um, Dr. Sell in the film who says that she thinks of the fetuses as babies. So certainly not a pro-choice talking point, but a very real and honest accounting of how she feels. And you also see just how complicated the women's, the patient's feelings are towards making these decisions, despite the fact that all of them feel that this absolutely should be a right. They may still have complicated feelings of grief or loss, um, because of going through the experience, but still absolutely are certain that this is the right mm. decision for them. Um, so I think in the end, it turned out that even within the clinic, things weren't black and white, that there is a big gray area and that's, that's really embraced. Martha and Susan, thank you so much for coming in and talking about your film, After Tiller. We'll put a link at our website with any luck it's coming to a town near you. And check out Grid TV's entire archive on the subject where we've made this point over and over this is a complicated, multifaceted story. Thanks for watching. Well, we have uh, seen an enormous number of laws put into place since Roe v. Wade. Laws that restrict access to abortion and so-called pro-life measures that uh, uh, are reflected in so-called feticide laws that are usually passed in the wake of a vicious attack on a pregnant woman. She dies, she loses the pregnancy, and the anti-choice movement, the pro-life movement, comes in with legislation to create a special crime for killing the fertilized egg embryo or fetus as if it is a separate person. And the promise is that this will reduce violence against pregnant women and protect the unborn, and it has nothing to do with abortion or anything else. What we found is that both of those kinds of measures have been used to justify uh, the arrests, detentions of, and forced interventions on pregnant women, most of whom are not seeking to end their pregnancies. It's providing the legal basis for locking up and tying down pregnant women. Abortion wasn't illegal in the United States until the late 1800s. And the way in which it was made illegal was not through a religious movement. It was a response to uh, a dropping birth rate of white people, which is where we are now. White people are not going to be the majority for long. Uh, there was a rising immigration and xenophobia. 
Um, and there was the beginning of the suffrage movement, women's equality, which male doctors and professionals understood as very threatening to their power. And they went to the state legislature to put midwives and others out of business uh, and empower themselves to have control over women. And that's how abortion became criminalized, a response um, to rising immigration, lower birth weights, and also a period in time when we were switching from agrarian to industrial. In uh, an industrial society, people were frightened. They didn't know what was going to happen. We're in that moment again. People don't know how they're going to make a living in a post-industrial age. And so they appeal to people's biggest fears about how does family work? Who's going to take care of the children? What role am I going to have in my life? And they play into those fears so they don't see that we could be working together to create an economy that supports everybody and isn't just a mechanism for transferring wealth to the wealthy. I think all politicians follow the people. And I think what we can do to start with is broaden our base. And I think that base includes a lot of people who identify as pro-life, but who are really pro-lives. In other words, they don't just value one life when they look at a pregnant woman. They don't only value the unborn child. New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof clearly cares about violence against women. He's won two Pulitzer Prizes and co-written a whole book about female survivors of violence that the public television network PBS made into a multi-part documentary. He's written about whisking women's sex slaves out of brothels and so on. So why does the Times star sexual violence crusader irritate me so much? I'll try to put my finger on it. Inspired by a panel he'd been part of at the Davos Forum not long ago, his column considered Facebook CEO Sheryl Sandberg's thesis that women in business hold themselves back. Corporate obstacles and chauvinism are partly to blame, but Sandberg believes women don't push themselves as aggressively as men. They don't lean forward. That lack of leaning is a problem, said Christoph in his column. Let's encourage young women to lean in, but let's also change the workplace so that when they do lean in and assert themselves, we're directly behind them shouting right. Oh, please. Perhaps it's the amount of ink spilled on the problems of CEOs that's so irritating. Then again, who do we think is reading the newspaper of record, The Times? What's left of it between the Tiffany jewelry ads? Christoph clearly dedicates plenty of words a year to the women at the bottom of the heap, but that's another part of my beef. A classic Christoph story portrays a former prostitute turned businesswoman who's lifted herself out of grinding poverty by giving her bootstraps a tug. Watch his PBS series and it's packed with this sort. It's a similar narrative to the woman with the ho-hum career in macho business and then the Samberg who by dint of leaning in rises to the top. What are common in Christoph's stories are heroes. What are rare are movements or groups. A hero like Sandberg can win a prize, break a record, even crack a glass ceiling or two. But change the working conditions for all workers? Sandberg apparently has found it hard enough to change the boardroom. After a year on the job, she was still the only female on the board of Facebook. Even a woman who isn't aggressive deserves not to be destitute. That's the point. And that's what collective bargaining is for. Yet unions, Christoph seems to like a whole lot less than heroes. Peruse the long list of ways to lift women out of poverty at the Half the Sky TV program website, and collective bargaining doesn't receive a mention. When the 87% female Chicago Teachers Union went out on strike, Christoph came out strongly against. It's great that it's possible for women to advance in business these days. But even that required a movement. Harvard Business School didn't admit women until 1978. A survey of 535 restaurant employees and 35 employers by the Restaurant Opportunities Center in New York revealed that kitchen staff barely, if ever, get a chance at promotion, even if they lean in for all they're worth. Leaning in is nice, but having rights is better. Having movement power at your back as MasterCard would say, that's priceless. For The Laura Flanders Show, I'm Laura Flanders. The issue was never just about Mike Brown. It was about a, an endemic 
system, an endemic sort of history of police violence, and not just police violence, but just policing right. of people. Um, where Ebola is yet another uh, disease that is um, really being treated with a lot of media um, sensationalism and, and hysteria, and there, there's such a general public fear. And so we're beginning to see, I think, poor health policy responses. We were all at risk. Uh, because all of our hospitals are really not ready.